to the Yvonne Candy Show. Motivational, inspirational, and just plain fun. Where celebrities check in and you can check out what's fresh in entertainment, business, health, finance, and more. It's all about your lifestyle. Here's your host, Yvonne Candy. Hi, guys. Welcome to the Yvonne Candy Show once again. And if you're new to the show, you're in for a treat. We have the most interesting guests. I think all of my guests are rock stars. Like our guest next week, Vaisal Sony, owner of Masala Kitchen, which is right here in Center City, Philadelphia. Masala Kitchen is a unique Indian restaurant that has been featured as one of the best places to eat by Fox Food Bite, FYI Philly on ABC, Philly Magazine, Eater Philly, and more. Vaisal will be sharing his success story, and he'll also be bringing one of his unique Indian dishes on the show, so I can't wait for that. But today's guest is entrepreneur, real estate expert, and co-host of Netflix series Stay Here. Peter Lorimer will be joining us. Peter was Keller Williams' top-selling agent for three consecutive years in the entire L.A. region. He now owns his own brokerage firm, PLG Estates in Beverly Hills. Peter will be giving us some tips on how we can increase our short-term rental income and more. We'll also be talking about his rock star pass that you may not know about right after this message. At any given moment, somewhere in America, a baby is taking a first step a developmental milestone. But for too many parents, a baby's first steps aren't just a milestone. They're a miracle. These are the parents of babies who were born prematurely or with birth defects. It's a crisis affecting more than half a million babies in the United States each year. You can help them by joining volunteers like you who walk in March for Babies. The money you raise funds research and local programs that help babies overcome the challenges of premature birth and birth defects. Together, our steps make stronger, healthier babies a reality for thousands of families. Sign up today at marchforbabies.org to take the steps that help make milestones and even miracles possible. Who will you march for? You're listening to The Yvonne Candy Show, where it's all about your lifestyle. And we are back with my guest, Peter Loingmer. Hi, Peter. Greetings. How are you, Yvonne? Greetings to you. How are you today? Are you in L.A.? I'm in L.A. on Sunset Boulevard as we speak right Uh, now. Well, the weather must be nice out there because it's crazy here. Yeah, it is. Uh, I suspect it's a lot more cheery and bright than, uh, <laughs> than locust. Yeah, I got right? here through the slush and the slide, and <laughs> oh, it, it, it was horrible. But you're from the UK. Do you think this weather is weather is better than the UK? Well, you know what? I've been in California for 25 years, right. and uh, I never get bored of um, 85 degree days, clear blue skies, and sunshine every day. How can you? Uh, I'm I'm perfectly happy with it because I grew up in the north of England, which is terribly cold and terribly snowy and terribly rainy. So, you know, I uh, was yeah, in England a while ago, and um, the only thing it did was rain. Uh, it, it, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was cloudy. All That's all I remember. I don't remember anything else except for rain and cloudiness. So this has to be better than that. Uh, it is. I mean, I, I'm I'm very blessed in in LA. I think we get something like 300 days of sunshine a year. Wow. So, yeah, and I know you don't get that in Philly. No, no, but it's not uh, cloudy and and rainy like it you know, like it was when I was in uh, England. I it's just not like that. You know. So we do no. have our four seasons, which I enjoy. You know, and I yep. I I, kinda... and I, ha- I happen I happen to love Philadelphia. And I love the people from Philadelphia, and I love the people from Detroit. And I, I think Philly has a. It, I, I'm from a kind of a. I'm from a city called Leeds, which is near Manchester, which is the industrial north of England. Right. And so I, I think the folks in Philly remind me of people from my hometown. And uh, <laughs> I've always, I've always liked it. And I used to actually DJ in a club on Locust. 
oh, back in the day. Yeah, that was the place to go back in the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a long time ago. So. Yeah, my my you have to talk to my husband about that because he's in the the same industry as a you know a music producer they call it now, and uh, yep. he you know that's. Matter of fact, I met him not too far from around there, so he knows about that area very well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm still trying to get the English accent, accent Peter. <laughs> <laughs> my, you, yeah, gotta, you might be, you might be, you might be trying for a while, Yvonne. I I know, but you got to hear my husband. I really thought my husband had the English accent down pack until we got to London, right? And um. All of a sudden, he turns into this Englishman, and he's he, he he's talking. He sounds like he's choking off of something, you know. And somebody said to him, man, what are you talking about? That's when I knew he didn't know what he was doing, you know. He, he, he well, <laughs> all of this time. English? No, no. He's, he's a Florida boy, you know. I thought he knew what he was doing. Well, he's in the entertainment business, so, you know, he's a character. I thought he knew what yeah. he was doing until we got to London, and everybody said to him, man, what are you talking about? What, what, what? <laughs> he thought he had this accent. <laughs> he thought he had this accent, and he, t- he sounded like, but come to find out, come to find out, he was talking more like Cockney or something, you know. Well, Cockney is a very specific accent, yeah. and I have yet to hear an American pull Cockney off. The oh. closest and it wasn't close, was Dick Van Dyke in Mary Poppins. So, oh, well, you got you know, to hear his Cockney that, accent. I think I think he might be close. It's just that he thought it was another accent, and it turned out to be something else. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, but anyway uh, you, I want to talk a little bit about your past because your past sure. is amazing. You produce some of the most famous artist that we know today. So tell us about your past. You were a record producer. Yes. Or a music producer, yes. whatever they call it today. But you were a music producer. Tell us how you started on that journey and some of the people that you recorded. So I, um, when I was a, a, a kid, you are, there were three things you did um, in, in where I grew up. It was a kind of a, a tough town. And you either did sports, you did crime, or you played in a band. So I elected to play in a band, and, mm. and I really kind of fell in love with music. And I was actually headed down the road of being a classical musician. Um, and I was given a, a free scholarship to the Royal College of Music at, at, at very young, at 13 years old, for being an exceptional classical trombonist of all, mm. of all instruments. Mm. And then what that meant was I was touring with orchestras with musicians that were a lot older than me. And then in the mid eighties, I remember being in a nightclub at like 14 years old. Cause I was, I was a tall, I was over six feet at like 12. So in England, you never need to, sh- you didn't need to show ID. If you look 18, you're in and that's the drinking age over there. And mm. so I used to go to the nightclubs with all the other musicians in the, in the orchestra. And that is where I discovered my muse. That's where I discovered my, the, one of the loves of my life, which is house music, dance mm. music. Mm. And for, for your listeners, it could be translated as the music that goes, ooch, 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 yeah, ooch, yeah, in yeah. nightclubs. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, you know what? Screw the trombone. I, I want to go off and make those records. So I dropped out of high school at 15. I ran off to London, didn't know a soul to seek my fortune in the music business. And after a series of dead end jobs, working in restaurants and I was a security guard and a whole bunch of stuff, I I got a break to be uh, an assistant in a recording studio. And then I worked my way up to being the chief engineer at that studio. Hmm. Um, And then I, I, I kind of forged a clientele. And I, I, I went freelance and I worked with people like, uh, I mean, going all the way back to George Michael and In Excess. And then when I retired, I was working with people like Christian Aguilera and Seal. And, and, and I worked with everybody in between. And I, I ended up having over 30 number ones in the Billboard Club charts in wow. the U.S. And, and over 25 in the U.K. So. And you also work with Pink, right? I also work with Pink. That's right. Wow. Cheryl Crow. 
You're forgetting well, people, you've Peter. My, you've got my discography in front of you. <laughs> yes, I did Cheryl Crow as well. Oh wow, well, you don't even remember. You've done so many people, you don't even remember yourself. I got to, I got to remind you. <laughs> <laughs> I got to remind you of all of these people. So you're no longer a record producer, Peter? Well, that's very interesting that you ask, Yvonne, because I have not done a record since 2005. And then uh, one of the last records I did, which was on, an, on uh, uh, a label called Perfecto, which is owned by... Um, one of the gods of electronic music, Paul Oakenfold. Uh, it was a big hit. It was a number one in a bunch of countries. And, and then I retired. I retired and went off into real estate, which I'm sure we're going to touch upon. Sure. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and then, lo and behold, Paul calls me up, who's actually a client of mine as well. He calls me up and he says, we're re-releasing 29 Palms, Touch the Sky. And uh, it's going to be the single off of the Perfecto greatest hits of the 25 of 25 years so i'm actually remixing my own single from 15 years ago so that will be coming out this summer and i'm nearly done yeah that seems to be the thing nowadays especially over in europe they do a lot of that Mm -hmm. yeah so i'm back in the studio and i love it yeah well i it i thought that was your passion from what i hear how did you get into real estate (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> how did, oh. how did you transfer from being a record producer and going into real estate? That's your second you passion. Know, I, well, it's you know I I, I I I wish it was as romantic as that. It, it's much more a case of I was in I was in the music business from professionally from sixteen for about eighteen years, right? Eight, sixteen to twenty years, something like that. And um, I've I've always been really kind of techy and, and, and very digitally savvy. And I saw that um, MP3s were going to utterly decimate the music industry. Plus, mm-hmm. I've been trying to figure out my next move because mm-hmm. as, as much as I love being in nightclubs, I didn't want to be DJing in nightclubs at 40 and 50 years old. Not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with that. It's just not for me. I'm just imagining that. Uh, That's funny. Um, and so I, my mother, when she was alive, lived in England, and my brother moved to Australia many, many years ago, and I realized that the house prices in both of those countries were massively more than they were in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles was very undervalued on the uh, uh, U.S. stage, I thought, for property. So I took my winnings from the music business, and I started investing them into property in Los Angeles in areas that I thought would pop. And I had no skill set, but I had that gut feeling, the same gut feeling that led me to London at 15. And lo and behold, it didn't let me down. And I was able to predict areas that would flourish. And I managed to get out of uh, most of my investments before the, the market crashed. And then I took the money I made from real estate and invested it into Apple and Netflix and uh, um, a few other things that have just gone ballistic. Yeah, technology. They say that's the thing nowadays if you want to invest in stock. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so then I, I, what happened was when I was investing in property, my old tribe, as I like to call them, the, the music business, mm-hmm. who do, do not trust corporate types at all, Mm-hmm. They were like, well, hey, Pete, so what are you doing? You know, we, we, we really like you and you seem to be doing well at this. Can, can we invest with you? So I thought, you know what, I'll just get my license. I got my license and then I joined Keller Williams. Before you know it, I was the number one Keller Williams agent in Los Angeles. And uh, then I started my own firm with my wife and we've gone from two agents and one tiny, tiny office to, to five offices and 200 agents. Wow. Yeah, real estate is one of the most secure investments, I think, that you can take. You know, I mean, yeah, you can make mistakes and somebody could uh, buy wrong, but most most likely you won't, you know, because real estate, everybody got to have somewhere to live, right? Well, everybody's got to have somewhere to live, and I think, I think one of the best investment strategies is, and a friend of mine told me this from Wall Street, he said people are obsessed with buying at the bottom of the market and selling mm-hmm. at the top. Right. He said, 
that's the wrong way to invest. As long as you invest and the elevator goes up, that's a good investment. Right. Even and if you so, have good rental income, right, Peter? Because sometimes it may be marginal, the market price. But if you're getting a fantastic income off of your rent, I think that might be also worth a sale. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, there, there are many strategies for, for investment. My my personal strategy is buying in, in cities that I believe will continue to grow. I'm less interested about the ROI of the rental. Mm-hmm. Of course, I want to make money on the rental, right. but I'm more interested in the 10-year appreciation on the property. Right. So case in point is this. In Ohio, you can buy properties that have great rents, but they don't appreciate, whereas I would much rather earn less money in rental and have something in Los Angeles where I live because the growth over 10 years will be exponential. You service... Uh, with PGL Estates, some very high-profile clientele. Why don't you give us a few names? Name drop for me. Here is the thing about that. (laughs) If I started giving you celebrities' names, Mm -hmm. I would be in breach of my NDA. I had a feeling you were going to say that. Yeah. Oh. I can't kiss and tell. But I worked with the biggest of the big. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll leave you with that. Every well, rock star you can think of. Yeah, well, I guess your music career really helped you out with that. It did. Yeah, it did. And, and I don't, I don't wish to be coy with you. It's just I really do have NDAs, and if I if I betrayed their trust, uh, I would lose that business. Yeah, I under- those business managers. I understand that completely. How did you get on Netflix series Stay Here? That's one thing I wanted to talk about. Well, that's exciting because (laughs) it it is, it is. Um, In L.A., there are a lot of people that have multiple careers, like they're trying to be, you know, movie stars and they're they're working in a bar or they're a real estate agent and they're trying to get on a a soap opera. Now, I wasn't one of them. I wasn't going around doing auditions and trying to find uh, some position on the TV. Um, I literally got called by Netflix and they, I thought it was a joke. Wow. Somebody called me and they said, hi, this is such and such from Netflix. Would you be interested in hosting a show? And I said, yeah, uh-huh. Who is this? <laughs> Which one of my mates is this? Hello. Yeah, you got me. Yeah, how lucky is um, that, right? <laughs> and I, I didn't think for a second that I was going to get it. <clears throat> and um, I didn't really even audition. I, I kind of met my co-host and then they offered me the gig. And I had not had one hour of television experience. Wow. That is absolutely wonderful. Yeah, T- tell us brilliant. how we can, because I wanted you to give the audience a, a few tips on how they can increase their short rental property income for 2019. And I heard you talk about that a lot. And I also wanted to know, is that the growing going trend these days? So I think short-term rental is a, is a phenomenally good strategy, and, and it's somewhat embryonic at the moment. And um, I feel that, that there are a couple of key factors with, um, with short-term rental that, that we as, as investors need to be aware of. Number one, you've got to make sure that you buy in a city that is Airbnb friendly, because I, there, are, there are plenty of people that have bought Airbnbs that now they're having problems renting because the city's legislation has changed and the guidelines and rules. So number one, if you want to invest in short-term rental, make sure you find a city that is Airbnb friendly. There are plenty of them out there, and there might even be different areas of your own city that are, that are short-term rental friendly like they are in L.A. We've got certain areas of Los Angeles that encourage it and other areas that shut it down. So there are some key ways to increase your ROI, which is your return on investment, which is in direct correlation to the experience of your guests. If your guests don't have a good time, they're going to leave a bad review, which means you're going to get less bookings. So predicting what your guests need before they need it is something that I I preach to all my clients who own short-term rentals, such as 
if somebody's flying in from the UK to Philadelphia, for mm-hmm. example, chances are the body clock is going to be off. They're going to be tired. They, they may have children with them. And they're not going to want to be necessarily arriving at the place they're staying, dropping their bags and going out for something to eat. So I think it's really important, and I encourage all of my clients to supply like a welcome basket or some kind of, I always suggest local, local snacks, um, and leave them some champagne, leave them some wine, leave some candy for the kids. And the way that you can check what works for your guests, because what happens if your guests don't drink alcohol and you may offend them, is a week before all of your guests arrive, send them a questionnaire of, do they drink? Do they eat meat? Are they allergic to anything? Do they have preferences? And then you stock the fridge and all the cupboards with the stuff that they love. You've already set the tone for their experience when they walk through the door that you're thinking about them as a guest rather than as a, 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 a commission. Wonderful. Now, can anyone turn their home into a short-term rental? You can. I mean, a lot of people use part of their home to be a short-term rental. Um, I, it's all viable. Now, um, again, I'm not even going to talk about permits and city code, but you've got to follow that stuff too. But let's just say... Um, you want to turn the upper level of your home into a short-term rental, which many people do. Mm-hmm. Predicting mm-hmm. or the lower floor. It might be easier with the lower floor, right? You want to turn the lower floor into, into a short-term rental. So when short-term rental was, a, was a, uh, an emerging industry, I, I love the fact that the industry was direct owner to consumer. There was no middleman. There was no real estate agents complicating it. And so what, just by, by definition, as the industry was new and it was finding its way, you found a lot of people that were using, you know, granny's old couch in the living room, maybe a spare <laughs> bed yeah. that was an, 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 an old dresser that used to be in one of the kids' rooms. Yeah. <laughs> so that's now changing. And you... It doesn't cost a lot to go to somewhere like Ikea or some other, you know, uh, uh, Crate and Barrel or some other place where you can pick up furniture at a relatively inexpensive price that looks new and fresh and clean. Because what my mantra is this, you've got to treat short-term rental as a business and every business you have to invest in. You don't look for the cheapest way to do stuff. You look for the best way to do stuff. And that is to provide um, services and, and furniture and smellies and flowers and snacks and music and candles so that your guest experience is beyond what they expect. And that's a great way to have additional income coming in. It's a lot of people who are uh, empty nesters. Uh, they can right. also, yeah, I mean, instead of downsizing, wait, my, why not do a short-term rental of even your partial uh, home space? So I think this is basically a good idea to supplement one's income, especially baby boomers who have that extra space. So this is a great idea. Yeah, I, I, and I think that you can be as hands-on as you want or as hands-off as you want. There are more and more uh, full-service management companies that will service your, your short-term rental. They will meet the guests. They will do the laundry. They will supply the cleaners. They will pack the fridge. They will pack the cupboards. Obviously, they take a, a sizable chunk of the profit. But it, for me, if, if the investment strategy is get as many properties as I can, and I would rather scale it, than, than, than screw every dollar out of every property, property, then having full service management is something that I don't, I don't need to worry about a pipe bursting. I, to run out. I hear a little bit of static, Peter. Say that one more time, darling. No, I can hear you now. Oh, did I disappear for a second? You disappeared for a second. <laughs> I am so sorry. That's so okay. Sorry. That's okay. So go continue um, what you were saying. So 
So I was saying that, you know, I'm a very big believer in, I don't know where I lost you, but I'm a very big believer in full mm-hmm. service management right. for short term rentals. Mm-hmm. Because what that allows me to do as an investor is to scale it. So if I've got one short term rental where I'm meeting the guests, I'm changing out the toilet paper, I'm doing the laundry, I'm cleaning the place between visits, then there's no way that I can scale it. Right. Whereas if I've got 10 short term rentals over time, I hire a full service management company. I don't make as much profit, but that's okay because I'm making appreciation on the investment as a whole. And I can scale it as much up or down as I like. Now, tell everyone how they can find Stay Here. It's, it's on Netflix, and what you've done is what, just your first season? Just the first season. Hopefully, we're going to start shooting season two uh, later this year. Um, and they can find it on Netflix. And you look under Stay Here for a very handsome man with massive glasses, <laughs> with a funny accent, and there I will be. <laughs> And you specialize in luxury homes at PLG? Um, I specialize in the creative people of Los Angeles. So I set up a company where my focus was to go after the creatives, the songwriters, the actors, the musicians, the scriptwriters, the you know, uh, assistant cameramen. Uh, as a company, we set it up that way. So we look after the creatives of, of uh, Greater Los Angeles. Peter, and a give, lot of them are luxury. Give everyone your website address uh, for PLG Estates. So plgestates.com is my uh, website for my company, and peterlorimer.com is my website. And at Peter Lorimer, you can find me everywhere, Instagram, Twitter, everywhere. Thank you so much, Peter, for being on the show, and I look forward to talking to you again. It was wonderful, Yvonne. Thank you for having me on it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the Yvonne Candy Show. Don't forget to visit us at Yvonne Candy Radio on Facebook and Yvonne Candy on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Well, you know my motto, live the life you deserve. Thanks for listening to the Yvonne Candy Show. Want to know more? Check out YvonneCandy.com.